It is my pleasure to introduce our wonderful speaker, Dr. Lara Leitgen Nieves. Dr. Leitgen Nieves received her PhD in criminal justice from the Graduate Center of CUNY at New York in 2018. She has been an assistant professor with USI's criminal justice department since the fall of 2018, teaching introduction to corrections, statistics, criminology, mass incarceration, and senior capstone. Her research interests and expertise include substance abuse, mental health, correctional treatment, and problem-solving courts. Taking a more applied research stance, she worked with local sheriff's offices and jails, pretrial services agencies, and family and drug treatment courts. Today, Dr. Ladgin Nieves will be discussing assessing substance abuse and mental health needs in Midwest County Jail. Um, what I'm really gonna talk to you guys about today is this exploratory research project that um, me and two of my former uh, colleagues, Drs. Brooke, I don't know if they're on the call or not, but uh, Drs. Brooke Mathna and Martin Cohen, uh, we embarked on this last fall in collaboration with the Vandenberg County Sheriff's Office. So super close to home for those of you who are tuning in and you're in the Evansville greater area, right? Now, what was cool about this project is Sheriff Wedding actually approached us. Um, he wanted to have a, ca a casual conversation, kind of centered on, you know, what was going on a bit, um, around Vandenberg County Jail, right? Uh, for those of you who are unaware, it's a pretty overcrowded facility, um, even in comparison to other jails across the country. Um, it was originally built to hold, I think, about 585 individuals, and it currently holds closer to 700. Um, the jail also has to kind of farm out individuals to other counties simply because it's unable um, to keep up with the people that they've been tasked with um, supervising. Right, and so he wanted to talk to us about overcrowding and then essentially what he felt was driving crime, which was causing the overcrowding at Vandenberg County. So, you know, we kind of essentially just asked him, well, what do you think? Like, what do you think is causing um, crime in Vanderburg County? And much like everybody else, right? I think we would probably all agree if you ask anybody here, um, a lot of it centers on drugs and substance abuse, right? And again, he's not alone in this thought process. Um, Particularly when it comes to the relationship between crime and drugs or crime and substance abuse, we know that time and time again, drug users are consistently and significantly um, uh, more likely to engage in crime and, and criminal behavior. And there are a variety of reasons why, right? Um, maybe an individual steals or commits theft in an effort to get money so that they can then feed or support their habit, right, or their addiction. Um, maybe they commit some kind of violent crime because of the pharmacological effects of the drug that they're taking. You know, whatever the reason or regardless, right, we know that drug users are about three to four times more likely than non-users to be engaged in crime. And so, you know, what we also started talking about was mental health, right, because while a lot of people are aware of that link between drugs and crime, people are a little bit less aware of the relationship um, or the interplay with mental health right? Um, a great deal of the time, you know, substance abuse may develop as a coping mechanism for mental health issues. You know, basically an individual will experience symptoms of a mental health problem and then use various substances, whether it's alcohol or, you know, illegal drugs to kind of, of self-medicate and, and try and suppress some of those symptoms that they're um, experiencing. And so, sorry, long story short, right? And after that conversation with the sheriff, um, we decided that our first goal in our kind of collaborative unit was going to simply be to assess what level of need existed at Vanderburg County Jail in terms of substance abuse and mental health. Um, and, you know, I make that sound really simple, but it, it really was not all that simple. Um, but it was exploratory in nature. And so that's what we're going to talk about today. Um, number one, why we did this, kind of set the stage for it, um, but also what we found, what we did. Uh, and what it even means, right? Because you can sit here and collect data all day, but what are you gonna do with it? What, what, what does it even matter if you're not gonna take that data and move forward with it in this kind of endeavor? So that's kind of where we're gonna go for, for today. Oh, I don't, sorry, hold on just a second. There we go, okay. Um, so 
As most of you are probably well aware, um, we embarked on an era of mass incarceration back in the 1970s, right? Decades long era. Now, much of the conversation when we're talking about mass incarceration centers on um, prisons, right? That's mostly what we focus on, but the conversation or discussion around jails in particular remains relatively silent, right? Jails are kind of just thrown, thrown by the wayside. And that's unfortunate because jails are the front door to the criminal justice system. And yet they're the most underfunded, under-resourced, most neglected, most overlooked piece of the criminal justice system. And this is the case in academic research as well, honestly. So um, because I'm not too sure of where the audience stands and their knowledge of the difference between prison and jail, it's important to differentiate. Um, they do serve two different purposes and two separate populations, right? So prisons generally um, house people who have been sentenced to serve a term of incarceration uh, for a felony level conviction. And they're gonna serve anywhere from a year to life or death, depending on um, that state. Jails on the other hand are a little different, <laughs> a lot different, right? They hold two primary populations. Number one, they hold those who have been convicted typically, now this can be different, but typically they hold people that have been convicted of a misdemeanor and are serving no longer than 12 months of incarceration. They also hold people who are, are they're called pretrial detainees, right? They haven't actually been convicted of the crime for which they're being held. So this can be anybody being held on um, a, a simple possession charge, let's say, all the way to being held on murder, right? Now, there are a number of reasons why somebody may be held prior to trial, right? Um, maybe they can't afford their bail. Maybe they're waiting bail to be set. Um, maybe bond was just simply denied. Now, as you can see from the, um, the figures that I've, I've placed up here, right? Though the rates of people under correctional supervision in general have decreased since 2008, um, the rate of jail incarceration has actually remained pretty stable and pretty substantial, right? There's about 740,000 people in our jails on any given day across the nation. If you turn to the figure on the right though, all right, you can see that a vast majority of those that are held in jail are what are called pretrial detainees, right? So those people who have not actually been convicted yet. And this is kind of one reason why jails experience an incredibly high turnover rate, right? They can be released literally in a moment's notice. Um, maybe charges are dropped. Maybe uh, they make bail and they're released. Um, maybe they reach a plea agreement or maybe they're transferred to a state institution or facility. Um, going back to the kind of the issue related to turnover, more than half of the jail population is turned over within one week, meaning more than half are both released and then admitted on a weekly basis across the nation. And yet still, though jails are not intended for somebody to be there for a long period of time, um, the average length of time that somebody has been, um, uh, the average length of time somebody stays in jail has increased substantially since the um, early 1980s from just 13 days all the way up to 25 days on average now. And so, you know, all of that to say that jails are quite literally the gatekeepers of the criminal justice system. Almost always an individual cannot progress further into the system unless they've experienced jail first. In fact, you know, again, the conversation always centers on prison and yeah, prisons hold more people on an average, you know, if we just take a screenshot of any given day, but jails experience 20 times the number of admissions in a given year compared to prisons, mental institutions, and um, halfway houses combined, right? So, you know, that's kind of one reason to study jails specifically, right? Because, you know, study the institution, how they work, who's housed there, because arguably we would be able to reach a larger audience if we did so. So substance abuse, right? Mental health. Um, we know that jails in particular hold um, a pretty high need population, right? It's not only a large population, but a high need one in fact. So nationally, and this is in reference to that first um, uh, chart graphic, I guess on the left, nationally nearly 70% of everyone held in jail has a diagnosable substance use disorder. This clearly, as you can see, surpasses the rate of substance use disorders in the general population but also compared to those in other correctional populations. 
um, looking to the middle uh, graphic, you can also see that jails have, well, and you may have heard this in the news too, right? Um, jails have become the de facto mental institution. Um, you know, back in the 1960s, we embarked on what was called deinstitutionalization. Um, and so for those of you who are unaware, just briefly, it was basically the mass closing of state run uh, mental hospitals, right? And so these individuals had nowhere to go. Uh, you know, they end up committing crimes because in a lot of cases, they don't really uh, know any better, right? Um, and so they had to go somewhere and oftentimes it ended up being jail. And so Following deinstitutionalization, we saw the mentally, mentally ill jail and prison populations just um, proliferate exponentially, right? And so, um, you know, you, you can see here, uh, I think it was, yeah, it's still in the middle graphic, uh, more than half of state prison inmates and those held in jail nationally have a mental health problem. Now, mental health problems, right, um, is, kind of general. So it can range anywhere from anxiety, depression, to severe bipolar disorder, or even paranoid schizophrenia. Um, and just a quick note, um, individuals who are held or they're incarcerated, they cannot be forced to take medication for those, um, for those issues, right? You cannot force medication on an individual. It has to be voluntary, all right? Anyway, um, so still, uh, jails, regardless, clearly edge out prisons and the percentage of mentally ill that are held within their facilities. Further complicating the problem is when you look at those that have a serious mental illness while they're incarcerated, 72% of them also have a co-occurring substance use disorder, right? So it definitely complicates the problem when you have, you know, these co-occurring disorders um, happening simultaneously. Um, so again, this is a large high need population. Um, Nearly everybody in jail is going to be released back into the communities that they came from, most of them relatively quickly. And the communities they came from are often the communities that were conducive to their drug use in the first place, right? So without treatment while they're incarcerated, they're likely returning no better off than when they enter jail. And because jail is not exactly known for improving somebody's life, they'll likely return worse off than when they entered. So, what about um, access to treatment then, right? Uh, it's not great. <laughs> um, so despite this high need, uh, just 14% of those sentenced jail inmates receive any type of drug treatment while they're incarcerated. Now look closely at this chart, right? 14%, maybe some of you are like, oh, well, that's not bad. You know, they're not there for that long, high turnover, all of that. But treatment type matters, right? Detox is not treatment. Detox is simply, um, you know, a, a unit that can monitor or treat somebody who's going through medical detox, right? Somebody who would die without medical intervention because they're coming off of that drug. That's not treatment, right? So when you look at somebody who was put into a residential facility or unit, it was 7.6%. That's incredibly inadequate, right? It's, it's not going to, um, to get to the people that it needs to. Mental health treatment, as you imagine, is not much better right? Um, of those in need of, ment of mental health treatment, only 17.5% um, actually received it while they were incarcerated. And again, importantly, the type of treatment matters, right? Um, prescription medicines is not exactly treatment, right? Will it subdue somebody's symptoms? Absolutely, but it doesn't actually, you know, treat the individual. So again, um, if you look at the types of treatment only about 7% received actual professional mental health therapy. Now, with this, a lot of the therapy that's offered in these incarcerative um, populations is, you know, uh, psychotherapy, for instance. And psychotherapy, though it can have its benefits, isn't exactly, doesn't exactly have a stellar reputation with incarcerated populations in terms of behavioral change, um, because incarcerated populations see them as working for the institution and therefore not trusted or seem seemingly coercive or, or what have you, right? Mm -hmm. Sorry, just sidebar, if you guys hear my dog growling, I apologize, but she's uh, just apologizing in advance. Anyway, um, so <laughs> particularly though, with those who have mental health um, and are experiencing those issues and incarcerated, uh, if they're unable to receive treatment while they're incarcerated, they're likely gonna further experience mental health det deterioration, right? Because 
as you can probably imagine, having mental health problem and being in a facility like a jail is not exactly conducive to a great state of mind, right? It's already not good for somebody's mental health, generally speaking. Um, so, you know, if these people uh, are, are released back into their communities, they've been taught no coping skills, receive no treatment, um, they're going to arrive back in those facilities further deteriorated than they already were, um, likely unable or uh, unaware, right, of affordable treatment and health care and medications. And so they're likely going to return right back to jail pretty qu quickly and pretty routinely, right? They're going to cycle in and out. Um, now we're going to talk about substance abuse treatment, right? Um, not too much, uh, but a good substance abuse treatment, a good substance abuse treatment program does target mental health. Um, the problem though is a lot of these treatment programs just don't have the capacity to handle clients that have a mental health problem so severe that it impacts their cognitive functioning, right? Somebody who cannot really communicate, these programs are not going to be able to work with, unfortunately. Um, and even, even more so, just getting these substance abuse treatment programs in jail specifically is really difficult uh, for a number of reasons. Uh, they're incredibly lacking in resources and funding, um, incredibly high population turnover. Uh, you know, people in jail don't exactly stay there for too long and you want somebody to participate in treatment for at least 90 days. Um, you know, not to mention that these jails are overstaffed, or not overstaffed, I'm sorry, understaffed so they're incredibly overburdened they're already spread thin um they're already working over capacity as it is right so there's a lot of difficulties but still right you guys have have seen the need here you're about to see the need at vanderburg county um still jails present an incredible and a really critical opportunity to provide services or at the very minimum flag people who have a substance use disorder who have a mental health problem um, and get them connected to services that are in the community or, or community organizations that are willing and able to help um, so that maybe they can get some kind of, of assistance while they're um, uh, out, of, out of jail. And so all of that um, <laughs> kind of leads us to this exploratory research question, right? Just simply, what is the extent of substance abuse and mental health treatment need at Vanderburg County Jail? <clears throat> so, um, I'm going to try and be as brief as possible with it, but I'll still explain to you guys what we did. Um, you know, after we received IRB approval last fall, uh, we began data collection almost immediately. So we began in early November of 2019 and continued throughout the end of December. During this time, we were able to interview or survey um, about, well, not about, we were able to survey 203 people. Um, and this was this is pretty substantial because it does represent about a third of the people that were being held at the jail during this time, right? So a pretty good snapshot of what was going on. Now, in the creation of um, the questionnaire that we developed, um, which is the primary uh, data source that we relied on, I exclusively relied on two validated and widely used um, instruments that are used in correctional research. The first is a kind of combined, uh, two versions of the Texas Christian University drug screen. This is essentially just a, sh a super short questionnaire that assesses whether or not somebody has a substance use problem severe enough to warrant treatment. And then I also use the correctional uh, mental health screen. This isn't a diagnostic tool, right? I'm not a psychologist, um, <laughs> so uh, I couldn't give somebody any kind of diagnosis. Basically what it does is allow us to understand if somebody has uh, mental health problems that warrant further evaluation and further referrals, right? And so, all right, so here's what we did, right? Um, in terms of data collection. I, or one of the two other researchers on our team, uh, Drs. Math and uh, Cohen, if they're on the line, um, on the day that we were gonna go survey, um, we would show it to Vanderburg County Jail and we would speak with you know, whoever was in command at that time, right? Um, you know, we would go in, we would know which pod that we wanted to survey, we would communicate that, and then that sergeant or whoever would get us um, an up-to-date bed list, right? And a bed list is basically just telling us who is in that pod at that exact moment, right? Pods can have anywhere between 60 to 80 inmates, um, except for the women's pod that I think at one point had up to 110 because it was so overcrowded. Um, so from there, we would take this bed list, right? And we would engage in systematic random sampling. So 
we would just say take every seventh or whatever uh, individual on the list and select them for potential participation, right? Then we'd hand the bed list back to the command. Command would take it to the CO, and then the CO would approach, it, um, approach the potential participant, right? Basically, hand them an informed consent, um, ask or tell them briefly about what the survey, you know, uh, what the survey was about, and then ask them if they thought they'd be interested. If the person said that they were interested, they would then come up to um, a separate room. Uh, basically, it's a room in the old visitation area of, of the jail for anybody who may be familiar. This is an area that um, it's, it's used now for individuals to meet with their attorneys or child services or whatever. So there's a, a great expectation for privacy and there. there's no worries that COs would hear the answers they were given or anything like that. Um, so secluded. And then in the room, of course, researchers were separated from participants by plexiglass and, you know, half of a brick wall. Um, <laughs> once we secured consent from the individual, uh, we then essentially just asked them, uh, involuntary participation, all that, of course, right? Um, we would ask them if they wanted us to read the survey aloud to them or if they wanted to do it on their own. And literally every single person elected for us to read it aloud, right? And this could be due to literacy issues, but it could also, um, and more likely it was due to the cumbersome nature of filling this out on their side. There was no table. The ledge they had to use was incredibly tiny. So there's nothing for them to bear down on and write. And this actually really benefited us as researchers because we were able to explain things that maybe weren't so easily understood or clarify questions. And it allowed us to build a really good rapport with these individuals um, as well. So they completed the survey. We would assign a random study ID to them. And then uh, I would just keep those surveys, you know, locked up in my file cabinet in my office. I'm not going to go through all these because we're going to go through these um, as I present the findings. But, you know, we were interested in, in a number of things. Um, so, yeah, I'll just talk about these in just a second. So I just want to reiterate, right, like the purpose of this was just exploratory, right, just to see what the extent of need and um, of need of substance abuse and mental health treatment was at Vanderburg County. So I'm going to talk about what we found and kind of its implications, both for those being held at Vanderburg County, for the Sheriff's Office in general, as well as kind of public health and public safety in the greater Evansville area as well. Um, so again, we collected data on 203 people. Um, what you're going to see here is just kind of sample demographics, right? Nothing too crazy. You'll see that the average age of our sample was 36, which is pretty standard for jail populations. Um, you can also see that only about a quarter were female. That's on par with national statistics that show about a quarter of female um, jail inmates, or there, there are that many female jail inmates. Um, a majority of the sample um, was white, um, unmarried, right? Surprisingly, 70% were either a high school graduate or had received their GED, and this far surpasses national statistics. Nationally, only about half of jail inmates have their, their high school diploma or GED, so that was, that was actually pretty interesting. Um, a majority are also employed at least part-time. And then, you know, part of the reason we did this is because a lot of times when you want to write um, an external grant, say, you know, funding from a, a federal agency, you need to show support of why you need that money, right? Like a background, um, you know, an argument. And so one thing we were interested in was the issue of parenting and parenting skills. Um, because my argument later wants to be that, well, parenting classes and stuff like that needs to be implemented. I've worked with family treatment courts. I've seen firsthand that, you know, some people just don't know what it means to be a parent, right? They need, they need help in that. And so we found that a vast majority um, did have children and a vast majority also maintain regular contact with their minor children. So they're involved in these kids' lives. Um, they very well may benefit from some kind of supplemental parenting classes. All right, so what we really cared to find out, right? Um, this was surprising, but also not. Uh, <laughs> uh, our findings were consistent with that of existing jail and prison-based literature, right, in terms of the extent of the problem. An overwhelming number of our sample did struggle with both substance abuse and mental health issues. In fact, nearly 80% of those surveyed at Vanderburg County qualified as having a substance use problem, 
if you remember back to earlier, right, this far exceeds what we see nationally, right? Nationally, about 70% have a diagnosable substance use disorder. Um, when we look at mental health, unsurprisingly, if you know the literature, right, um, our study uh, our study results indicate that 65% of men and 71% of women have a mental health problem that warrants further referral or evaluation. This is also consistent <laughs> in the literature, um, both in terms of, of the extent, but also the fact that women often present with uh, um, more ex extenuating circumstances, <laughs> if you will, uh, related to mental health. And then when we look at co-occurring, right? 56% of the sample had both a substance use disorder and were in need of further mental health referral. Um, when I isolated just the mental health individuals, 85% um, of them also had a substance use problem. Um, so definitely a severe issue when we're looking at those with mental health, likely self-medicating um, with substances. Um, we also wanted to collect information on what's called drug of choice, right? So what drug a person would choose to use if they could, um, as well as the drug that, you know, they believe caused the most serious problems in their life. And those aren't always the same, right? You may prefer to smoke marijuana, but you know that methamphetamine or alcohol is, is bad for you, right? It's causing you some serious issues in your life. And so what we found, and unsurprisingly for the area, right, 30% of um, those surveyed indicated methamphetamine was their drug of choice, um, followed by marijuana, alcohol, other drugs, and heroin. Now, as a note, uh, that other category, I essentially um, collapsed all drugs that were you know, less than 5% in terms of their frequency. So other drugs here include crack cocaine, cocaine, hallucinogens, K2 or spice, and then um, prescription narcotics. And then finally, you can see that just 9% said that they had no drug of choice, which is fair considering 20% didn't have a drug problem at all, right? Now you look at the drug that causes the most serious problems, uh, arguably the one we probably should focus on the most, nearly 40% indicated that meth um, caused the most serious problems in their life. Now, while nearly a quarter said marijuana was their drug of choice, only 7% said it actually caused them serious problems. And, you know, just anecdotally in talking with a lot of these individuals, they said that um, the only reason marijuana caused them problems was due to its illegality, right? It didn't actually cause problems for them in terms of psychologically or, you know, or psychological or physical health or issues with their, their loved ones or their interpersonal relationships. So that was fascinating. Um, other prevalent, uh, most problematic drugs, if you will, were alcohol, unsurprising, um, heroin, K2 or spice, which literally every single person who talked about K2 or spice said it was the worst thing that they had ever tried, um, uh, also fascinating, and then other drugs. Now, interestingly, 15% said that no drug caused them serious problems. Again, that makes sense for those who didn't have a problem, right? But some literally argued to us that, you know, for example, people will use methamphetamine just to stay up to do their work, but that it didn't actually cause them any problems. Um, so definitely, you know, a difference in probably a way, the way a lot of us think about um, these kind of substances. Um, similarly, right, people would also use marijuana or alcohol occasionally, but said that it didn't cause any serious problems. So that doesn't necessarily speak to the frequency of use anymore. So um, we also looked at several other indicators of drug use. Um, nearly everybody said they engaged in drug use in the year prior to their incarceration. I mean, this included alcohol and marijuana, and this doesn't include or speak to the frequency for which they use. So that's, that really doesn't tell us much, right? Um, what tells us just a little bit more is that 76% of those surveyed said that they engaged in past year serious drug use. Serious, I codified as using crack cocaine, powder cocaine, heroin, methamphetamine, and then street amphetamines, which street amphetamines are not too popular here, it seems. 79% um, also said that they've engaged in poly substance use, so multiple substances across the past year. Now, those 
Two past findings, right? The one about serious drug use and polysubstance use are particularly important when talking about the severity of substance use, um, simply because both are tied to and linked with recidivism and crime rates, right? Or increased crime, I should say. Um, now, importantly, we had no findings related to Xanax and Klonopin or heroin or other highly addictive um, prescription narcotics, but they were frequently mentioned, right? So they were actually frequently mentioned as kind of secondary substances. Um, so people would say, yeah, I use methamphetamine, but you know, I mix it with some Xanax or something like that. So those drugs were frequently mentioned. They just weren't kind of the primary drugs of choice or anything like that. So again, highly addictive substances. And so, you know, still that just looks into the past year use. Um, speaking more to some problematic uh, drug use is that fourth line, right? 15% of the sample engaged in daily intravenous drug use over the past year. Now, daily is a really conservative measure of IV drug use, right? Um, arguably, if somebody's using IVs weekly or monthly, that's pretty significant in terms of the severity of their drug use. Moreover, um, this speaks to an incredible public health issue, right? Because these are individuals who will get a release quickly. Um, they're gonna go back to using these substances. Um, they have increased likelihood of transmitting bloodborne illnesses, right? Like HIV, hepatitis B, hepatitis C, right? So these could spread throughout the community relatively easily. Um, and then these individuals also are at much higher risk for overdose, especially in the two weeks following their release, right? Because these individuals, you know, they may spend, let's say they spend that full 25 days incarcerated, so they've detoxed from the substance. Now they're going to be released into the community and they're going to go back and try and use exactly the amount they used before, right? And so there's that issue of um, tolerance, right? They think their tolerance is still up here and it's not. They're gonna use that and then potentially overdose. Um, so definitely some, some public health concern as far as that goes. Now, um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna kind of skip down uh, to prior treatment history. I think this is important because more than half uh, had engaged in treatment at least once before. Um, we tried to do a really good job of asking more questions about treatment, right? Making sure that it wasn't um, AANA, right? That's not treatment, that's more of a maintenance program. Um, or detox, we try to weed those things out. So that means more than half of this sample has already been identified by some system as having a substance use problem that needs treatment. So it's definitely uh, worth noting for sure. And then importantly, and actually really interestingly, 90% of the samples said that they would willingly and voluntarily participate in a program if it was offered within the facility if they were there, they said, <laughs> they all wanted to make sure I knew that. Um, what I thought was the most interesting about this was that some people who didn't qualify as having a substance use disorder still said that they would participate because these were individuals who had had a prior drug problem or had a problem in the past and they had overcome it. And so they recognized the importance of ongoing maintenance and ongoing education. And I thought that was super insightful. Um, many who were no longer in active addiction also said they would be willing to participate as, say, a peer specialist or a peer mentor within the program. Um, a handful also added that they would be interested if there were two things um, incorporated. Number one, aftercare, which, you know, the fact that they even were thinking in, in those ways was impressive to me. And then also mental health treatment, right? Because a lot of them, they had a great deal of insight into why they use drugs. Um, many of them mentioned that it was because they were trying to suppress some of those symptoms of, of mental health issues that they had or, or histories of trauma and stuff like that. Okay, so what, <laughs> right? We, we did all this work. Um, we, we found all this information or collected all of this information. Now there's a lot of things we can do with it, right? But first things first, right? What we promised to the sheriff was to do something, right? <laughs> to use this data. Um, so we drafted a technical report and we submitted that to the sheriff's office. And within that technical report included some recommendations um, for either policy changes or programs or what have you. And so um, one of the first things I recommended, and I'm kind of going from easiest to implement to much more difficult. Um, the first thing I suggested was implementing a brief screener as a sort of triage for targeting these people um, who are in high need. 
And my idea was that basically the screener could be implemented um, at jail booking uh, as soon as somebody was coherent enough to answer questions, right? Because anybody who's seen booking understands that individuals coming into the jail are often experiencing mental distress um, and or often under the influence. So those are not people who can rightfully answer questions. Um, so the screener could be something similar to the questionnaire that we um, uh, use during our survey, right? Uh, now the survey we did typically only took 10 minutes, but you can actually pull out a lot of the questions and get just to the like the nitty gritty, like just the few questions you need to um, diagnose, not diagnose, but you guys know what I mean. Um, and so literally it could probably be pulled down to like five minutes or fewer even. And so again, this would be something that, you know, was done when the individual was booked. Um, the idea here would be to simply, you know, use this as a flag for an individual, right? Flag those with some sense of use and mental health needs and at least get them connected with available services to help them, right? Maybe it could be a flag to get them diverted into um, substance abuse treatment in the community or uh, divert them to the drug court or, you know, or whatever, right? At very minimum, uh, hand them a pamphlet that has all the information of community organizations willing and able to help them, right? Because, you know, sometimes you'll find somebody is in need and they want that help, they need that help, but they don't know where to go, right? Imagine you don't have health insurance, you don't have all of these resources, you don't know where to go or that help is even available to you and it is, right? There are, there are organizations here that are underutilized pretty heavily. And so, you know, the truth is for many of these individuals, um, their arrest and their incarceration is the first real step they have towards treatment, right? Even just the recognition that maybe they do have a problem is enough for a lot of people. Um, another recommendation uh, involved the creation of a new position at the jail, and this is um, quite common in prisons and is starting to pick up in jails across the country as well, but that's just implementing a reentry coordinator. So this is just somebody who, um, you know, would help individuals get prepared uh, to be released. Um, you know, this wasn't asked on the survey, but a lot of individuals would reach out to us as the researchers and just say that, you know, what they really needed was support that extended beyond the jail, right? Not just in terms of um, preventing relapse of substance abuse or anything like that, but, uh, you know, uh, passing that barrier, right? So they say they're their most insurmountable barrier to success is the environment they that they return back to, right? Those environments that are conducive to their, their situation in the first place. And so many of them mentioned that they felt a lack of real meaningful support, both in terms of controlling their substance use and mental illness, but also in simply navigating the requirements of the criminal justice system. It can be quite confusing and, and cumbersome, right? Um, you know, they have to abide by certain probation or parole, depending on the situation conditions. Um, they have to be able to pay their fees and their fines. Um, get and maintain a job, and then also maintain those familial and community uh, social support structures, right? And so that said, those held at the jail, the jail itself, and the community at large could really benefit from this type of, um, of coordinator, right? Because they could gather information on what things this person needs in the community, what's going to help them. Is it substance abuse or is it housing? Is it education? Is it employment? Is it whatever, right? And so ideally this person would um, uh, lead us to a reduction in recidivism, ideally, right? And that benefits all of us, including um, those of us in the community for sure. And so finally, and ideally, um, we would love to, and, and the need is there, right? Um, we would love to implement a substance abuse and mental health program at Vanderburg County Jail. Now this requires not only securing funding, but also physical space. Now, I don't know, and I, and I can't remember if I mentioned this now at the beginning, but the sheriff has been um, pushing, right, for, you know, trying to garner financial support for a jail expansion, right? Again, they're severely overcrowded. They need more space. Um, and so that means there is no space currently, <laughs> right, to have a substance abuse treatment program, because when you have that kind of program, it's I mean, it's imperative that you separate those who are participating in the program from those in the jail's general population, right? So they can focus on treatment and behavioral change and all of that. Um, now, what's cool is that uh, several counties across the state of Indiana have actually received funding uh, from the Indiana Attorney General's Office in, uh, in collaboration with the Indiana Drug Enforcement Association. Um, 
their programs are, they're certified through the Indiana Department of Mental Health and Addiction. Um, people receive cognitive behavioral therapy and substance abuse counseling. Um, and so with the AG's office, um, as well as federal funding, who is almost always calling, you know, sending out calls for proposals for um, uh, programs such as what, you know, we need at Vandenberg County, uh, there's definitely ways to get that funding. Um, my recommendation, recommendation at the time was just that we needed space to do so, right? But we'll talk about that in just a second. So, you know, those were my recommendations. Uh, we then met prior to the start of this semester. Um, I met with the jail command staff to go over my technical or our technical report and then talk about the recommendations and just brainstorm like, you know, it's easy to say this is what we should do, but how is it going to work? What, what, what can we do right now, especially given the COVID restrictions and, and things of that nature? So um, we started this project, right, because we wanted to gather data and evidence for the sheriff to use to basically argue for jail expansion, right? To say, hey, I need this money to make this um, jail bigger, and then hopefully use part of that wing to dedicate specifically for, you know, basically residential substance abuse treatment program within the facility, right? Um, we were concerned that funding through the Attorney General's office wouldn't happen without expansion because again, we did not have the space. Uh, but I was actually able to get in touch with a representative from uh, the Attorney General's office and was basically told that was not necessarily the case. Um, he was like, no, you don't need like a whole pod dedicated to these individuals. You just need space where they can be separated. Um, so he was like one jail in Indiana. Um, they took an old recreation room and they just changed that to uh, the treatment group's living quarters, right? Um, another place took like two eight man cells within one pod and dedicated that just to treatment members. So yeah, they were surrounded by the general population, but they um, didn't have the same rec time and they didn't have the same lunch, right? So when they went on rec, general pop was um, locked down. So there were definitely ways to keep them separated. Um, and the jail commander was super excited about that. Uh, these programs that they've done across the state, a couple of evaluations have been done and they are showing really uh, promising results, like pretty serious reductions in recidivism. Um, so it's something exciting we can do. The problem was our, our conversation kind of kept going. We're like, well, who do we put in the treatment program, right? Because in jail, typically you reserve treatment programs for those who have been sentenced because those are people who are gonna be held in jail for at least 90 days or longer. Pretrial detainees can leave like this, right? And so it really creates that instability within the group. Um, so that's, that's problematic. The other thing is Vandenberg County is unique, right? A lot of its sentenced inmates are not held at Vandenberg County. They're held at other institutions, right? Because again, they're so severely overcrowded that they end up busing out about 150 to 200 inmates to other facilities in the nearby area. And so we kind of left off that conversation at the time with like, we need to think about this, right? So uh, it, I was tasked with basically looking up best practices um, and, and that's where we we're gonna go from there. However, two days after that meeting, um, I received a phone call from Sheriff Wedding and he's super excited, it was awesome. Um, and he had just left a meeting with the Vandenberg County Health Department. It turns out that they had, uh, they had been awarded a grant to implement a jail social worker, right? So the timing was kind of insane. Uh, it turns out that the jail social worker was exactly what I had recommended when I said re-entry coordinator. Literally same responsibilities, same job duties. Um, it was the same job completely. Um, so we have renamed it to a fancier title. Uh, it's a mouthful, but uh, we, we came together and this person is gonna be the recidivism reduction and re-entry program coordinator. Um, uh, myself and two of the, the reps from the health department, we drafted a call for applications that was put out a couple of weeks ago. And it's my understanding that they're now reviewing applications and beginning interview process. So we're hoping that this formally begins no later than January 1. So it's kind of cool to see, you know, recommendations come to life. Um, I'm hoping that what I can do is kind of use this as case study, right? Uh, follow this person around, interview them, see, you know, what the kind of issues are in implementation and, and how this works. Um, so I'm, I'm very excited about this. Um, 
And then in terms of future research, guys, there's so much um, that we can do here. Uh, Sheriff Wedding and the jail command staff and the correctional officers at, uh, at the jail have been um, incredible and so easy to work with. I mean, literally the opportunities are quite endless. So I do have to shout them out and, and thank them for that. But, you know, I, I wanna explore this data a little bit more. I kind of want to tweak my current survey to incorporate some semi-structured interview into there, right? Like ask, why why do you use, right? Nobody thinks to ask those kind of questions. Um, what are your barriers um, to, to success? Um, why did you start using? When did you start using? All of these kind of things to just kind of understand. Um, I want to interview uh, jail staff, get their perspective on things. Um, there's just, there's a lot to do, <laughs> right? Uh, so anyway, um, there's so much to talk about with this. So I, uh, yeah, I thank you guys for being here. I do have a one question, Laura, regarding the um, uh, perhaps potential um, social desirability that may be uh, present <laughs> with, uh, uh, I'm assuming any kind of self-report type of research. Um, do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, so I, I mean, I know I personally tried to establish a really laid back rapport, right, to kind of get their trust so that hopefully I would minimize some of those issues. I did notice several times um, where I could tell the person was not telling me the truth. They were telling me basically what I wanted to hear. Uh, so yeah, I mean, a big concern with that, but also on the flip side, people, you know, who over, overdo it as well. Um, but there is also, yeah, there's definitely the issue of social desirability. Again, you know, I, I always try and rely on my ability to build rapport with individuals and hope that they, they know that they can trust that you know, whatever they say is okay. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, do you have any plans to suggest specialized training for correctional officers working with um, SU? Oh, substance use. I mean, that's, I, yeah, that definitely should be on my list, right? Uh, so that's kind of one reason why I do want to interview um, the COs and the command staff is you know, even in these conversations with the command staff, you know, they'll, they'll frequently de defer to us, you know, they're often like, well, I'm the cop, I'm gonna let you guys handle this, <laughs> you know. Um, so it would be interesting to see, number one, what their perspectives are on substance abuse and mental health, and then kind of move from there on possibly, um, maybe starting with education on substance abuse, because a great deal of the general public is misinformed about it, right? Um, and then moving forward to smaller kind of training units with the CEO specifically. Uh, you know, I, I assume that uh, Evansville Police, for example, they see it more often, right? They're more hands-on. Um, well, that's a lie as well, right? Uh, these individuals are brought into the jail. Um, yeah, so definitely I would, I would probably start with just general education about addiction. Uh, then we have another question. Is the program intended for individuals who are convicted of a drug-related crime or anybody who self-reports a drug use or mental illness? So we're still developing that. My argument is, um, so people define drug-related crime different, right? Some people just say a drug's offense and I'm very much against only using drug offenses. Um, it wouldn't be self-report either. It would be an assessment um, that would be done, right? So somebody who actually has to be found, like you are definitely in need. You can't just say, hey, I'm in need, right? So yeah, somebody who is found to legitimately have a substance abuse need. And then also somebody who is higher risk. Uh, we have another question uh, by Aileen, um, suggesting that um, they have some social work experiences and hearing that the jail social worker will have, would have many responsibility. Uh, so I was wondering what kind of support there may be in the jail for that position and whether you think um, they will encounter resistance from other staff members? That's an excellent question. And we had that in our conversation as well. So that was my question when uh, we were developing this call for proposals uh, with the health department and the sheriff's office is, you know, how is this person gonna be able to fit in between both groups, right? Because technically they are under the authority of both the health department and the sheriff's office. I'm not entirely sure they'll be met with too much resistance um, like head on from staff because they're probably not gonna have all that much interaction. It's my understanding they're gonna be working around where the command staff is. Command staff is super on board with it, um, as well as the rooms that I told you guys about when I was talking about data collection. And that's substantially uh, further apart from um, where the CEOs are, right? 
Um, so I'm not sure that they're going to run into resistance from the COs necessarily, unless it's in terms of carrying out the program, right? So unless the CO, uh, let's say, I mean, hopefully they wouldn't think this, but thinks the program is worthless, right? And so they maybe refuse to get the person up to their appointment on time with the coordinator or whatever. But I'm hoping it's not going to be that bad in terms of support. Uh, I'm going to have to find that out. Uh, so they're still going under application reviews. It's my understanding that once we have um, the people kind of selected, we're going to all return together and talk more in depth about it. But this is still like an ongoing um, project and I anticipate some growing pains. Uh, we have another question. Uh, you mentioned the re-entry to society. Do you plan to have uh, some kind of coordinator uh, to work in this, regarding this transition in the house treatment to community correction for re-entry treatment as well. I was talking about like the coordinator that you like, the social worker that you just hired for the program. So will you have somebody like um, working like with, once they like leave, like doing tr like transitioning the same like treatment program? So it's my understanding, right? Understanding because again, this is all still in development, but it's my understanding that this person is going to help them to get released and then follow them or follow up with them once they are released. And so I'm also understanding that they're going to be the one who's in contact with the community organizations and, and things like that. I mean, at the end of the day, when somebody's released, you can't really compel them or, or force them to do the things that you've suggested, but you can follow up. Right. So if they are like released, like on probation, like would they just like follow up like with her probation officer? Yeah, but again, they can only be forced to do what the probation officer uh, requires. Right. But it'd be interesting if the coordinator could use or have some kind of leverage with the probation department um, and, and have that communication. In fact, I'm going to write that down because that definitely should be a component. Thanks, Michaela. You're welcome. <laughs> okay, it looks like that was our last question. Thank you very much, Dr. Lutkin-Nieves, for, for such a wonderful presentation.